Well, if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to Proverbs 27. We're getting closer and closer to the end. We left off in verse 20. We're going to try to finish 27 and get as far as we can in 28. We'll, we'll see. We'll see. 20 says this, hell and destruction are never full. So the eyes of man are never satisfied. The very first temptation was the serpent convincing man to look at something that God told him not to look at. To long for something that God had not given him. To convince him that what he had already been given was not enough. Hell and destruction, he says, are never full, so the eyes of man are never satisfied. Looking turns to longing and lusting. And longing and lusting turns to living. That's why Jesus said, if your eye is single, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is evil, your whole body will be full of darkness. Beholding is becoming. Beholding is becoming. That's why the writer of Hebrews says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. That's why David, a man after God's own heart, said in the Psalms, one thing have I desired, and that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, and he says this, to behold the beauty of the Lord. That's what made him a man after God's own heart. Beholding, looking, beholding. Paul says it like this in 2 Corinthians 3.18, but we all with open face, beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord are changed into that same image from glory to glory by the Spirit of the Lord. It's, it's beholding. It is, it is looking. Jesus said, come and see. Just come and see. Just, just watch me. Observe me. Look to me. <laughs> Far too often, you know, James says that we can look into the perfect law of liberty. James says, if you're a hearer of the word and not a doer, you're like a man who beholds himself in a glass. And then he goes away and forgets what manner of man he was. This, this is a glass. This is referred to as, as a mirror. I think far too often we're looking to see us through this glass. But Jesus says, behold, I come in the volume of the book. They, they testify of me. Right? Becoming is, is beholding. It's just simply looking to the Lord. The other day I was on my quiet time walk and the Lord said to me, far too many of my people are trying to follow me without denying themselves and taking up their cross. And he says, oftentimes, you're doing it too. And that, that began this whole, this, this pondering as I, as I did this walk on, Lord, okay, well, what does it mean, deny yourself? And most scholars and most teachers and most preachers and most commentaries will, will tell you what Jesus is talking about is self-denial. And the Lord revealed to me that is not what he's talking about. 
Because self-denial is what, is what the Pharisee did when he was looking at the publican and comparing himself to him, saying, Lord, I thank you that I, I fast twice a week. Self-denial. I, I pay tithe on all that I have. Self-denial. And I don't indulge in the things that the sinner does. Self-denial. But, but notice the problem with that is self is at the beginning of it. Self-centeredness, self-righteousness, self-absorbed. It's self, 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 self. And far too much of what we do in Christianity is self-focused. And we wonder, well, why are we not getting any better? When I sing in worship, I'm wondering, do I sound pretty enough? Or should I lower the volume? When I raise my hand, I'm wondering, who's watching me and what are they thinking about me while I'm doing it? It's, it's self, self. And Jesus says, deny self. Jesus is saying, Gordon, you're paying way too much attention to you. Stop looking to you. Look to me. Look to me because that is the only thing that satisfies. And that's a wake-up call right there. That is the only thing that satisfies. Jesus is the only thing that I've ever looked to that my soul didn't say, okay, what's next? Everything else is a what's next. Is there more? But not with him. When I see him, I'm like, wow. I, I, there's no need to look anywhere else. Amen? Amen? Verse 21 says, as the fining pot for silver and the furnace for gold, so is a man to his praise. So, so when you turn up the heat and, and you're trying, trying to refine silver, the dross comes to the surface. And, and Solomon is saying, when people praise you, that's when you find out what's in you. Whether, whether humility comes to the surface or haughtiness comes to the surface. Paul would tell us, as his brothers and sisters, don't even worry about what people say about you. Because in Corinthians, he says, for me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged of you or of man's judgment. He says, as a matter of fact, yay, I don't even judge my own self. I don't even judge my own self. Yet am I not hereby justified, he says. But he that judgeth me is the Lord. How many of you know that you're never as bad as they say you are? But, yeah, but, but you're never as good as they say you are either. So if you're not as bad as they say you are, or as good as they say you are, then they're not very good at judging you. So why even worry about their judgment? As a matter of fact, the Lord says, take heed when all men speak well of you. You're probably not doing something right if everybody likes what you're doing. David, the Bible says, behaved himself wisely over and over again. And he, he would go out where Saul would send him. And after defeating the Philistines, they're making their way back into the city. And the women start singing. Saul has killed his thousands. Man, in Saul's loving verse 1, he's like, I like, that's got a good catchy tune to it. I can, I can move to that one. I like it. And they get to verse 2. And verse 2 says, but David has killed his thousands. Tens of thousands. I know I didn't like that song. And the Bible says that Saul eyed David from that day forward. He was ate up with envy and jealousy. And this is what he says. What more could he have but the kingdom? When people praise you, that will tell you who you are. That's why it's imperative that we allow the Holy Spirit to root out the fear of man in our lives. Because the fear of man is a snare. 
and I will find myself living my life for man's applause and approval and appreciation and acceptance. Do you know that Jesus didn't live like that? Jesus upset his family, his followers, his fellow man. He upset the religious leaders. He upset he upset everybody, not because he was seeking to or trying to, but he wasn't worried about what everybody else thought. He lived his life in the audience of one. I want to say what my father wants me to say. I want to do what my father wants me to do. That, that's all that matters to me. I want to finish the work that my father gave me to do. So if, if you find yourself loving praise... Take heed. Be careful. Verse 22. Though thou shouldest bray a fool in a mortar among wheat with a pestle, yet will not his foolishness depart from him. <laughs> wow. Take a fool, put him in the mortar, take the pestle, and just grind him down to the finest of substance, and you will not separate his foolishness from him. I don't want to be that guy. <clears throat> Verse 23 through the rest of the chapter. May the Lord help us to hear his word. Be thou diligent, diligent to know the state of thy flocks and look well to thy herds. Be diligent to know and look well. Do your inventory and do your inspection. For riches are not forever and doth the crown endure to every generation. The hay appeareth, and the tender grass showeth itself. The herbs of the mountains are gathered. The lambs are for thy clothing. The goats are for the price of a field. And thou shalt have goat's milk enough for thy food, for the food of thy household, and for the maintenance of thy maidens. Solomon says, you need to pay attention to what you have. When the prophet was speaking to the little widow woman, he asked her this question. What do you have in the house? Now let me challenge you. What and if the answer you're looking for in your life right now is already there? What if what you're longing for and looking for, you already have? What if God wants to start with that to accomplish the great thing he wants to do in your life? But if you don't know what you have, you have no idea where God might choose to start with you. Everything that you have, I want you to think about everything that you have in your life. Your garbage can. Your toothbrush, your Bible, notebook, pen, what, every single thing you have, Solomon says, be diligent. Look well to it. Because you have been given a stewardship for it. You've been given a stewardship. And God is going to give an accounting. He gave to one five talents, and to another two talents, and to another one talent. And he called upon them to see what they did with it. Wait a minute, Gordon. Are you implying that there's nothing in my life that is not sacred? Are you trying to tell me that there is no such thing as the sacred and the secular? 
for the saint? Are you trying to tell me that whatever my hands find to do, it's spiritual? Whether I'm babysitting or changing a diaper or warming up a bottle or studying for a message or tying on my tennis shoes to go for my morning walk, what if I was diligent to know the state of all of that in my life? And what if I looked well into it? What might God do with all the stuff that he's blessed me with? I'll just let that rest there and just leave it to the Holy Spirit and your imagination to ponder it, because I think there's far too many things in our lives that we're overlooking, we're missing. We are surrounded by the blessings of God. We're surrounding with, with the organic ingredients for God to cook up something amazing. Chapter 28, verse 1. Love this verse. The wicked flee when no man pursueth. He's afraid of fear. There's nothing there but fear. How many of you know when you look at Deuteronomy chapter 28 that part of the curse, part of the result of not living in obedience to God is fear and anxiety. <clears throat> Fleeing from the enemy. Longing for morning. And when morning comes, wishing it was night again. I wonder if a lot of what we're seeing people experience in the church that we could flee when no one's pursuing. They're afraid of their shadow. They're afraid of every little noise. They're afraid of every little thing. But notice the contrast. But the righteous are bold as a lion. We call lions the king of the jungle. Because the lion doesn't worry. He's confident in every step. He'll walk day or night. There's no part of the jungle that he won't roam. He is not afraid of anything or anyone. You say, well, I'm not a lion, Gordon. You should be as bold as one. If you're a believer. If you're not a believer, then be afraid. Be very afraid. But if you're a believer, you have nothing to fear. If you fear God, there is absolutely nothing to fear. Nothing to fear. Well then, okay, 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 this is, this is intriguing to me. How do, I, how do I become bold as a lion? I look in the mirror, look at you. You're vicious, you're a beast, they're afraid. No, that's, that's not how. We've already established that, that becoming is a result of beholding. So as I look around at everything that makes me afraid, everything out here and everything in here, and then I look to the lion of the tribe of Judah, and I recognize who he is. I have nothing to be afraid of. My steps are ordered of the Lord. How many of you believe that your steps are ordered of the Lord? Unanimous. How many of you believe that God has a plan, a purpose, and an expected end for your life? Okay. So if God's got the finish line figured out, and he's got my next step 
figured out. And the next step figured out. What do I have to fear? What do I have to fear? Let me ask you this question before we move on to the next verse. What would your life look like without fear? What would your decisions be like? What would your conversation be like? What would it look like when you walked into the sanctuary with no fear? What would your prayer life sound like? What would your faith life look like with no fear? Bold as a lion. That is the way I want to live my life. And it's not going to come from me flexing. It's going to come from me recognizing whose I am and who I serve. Because all of hell trembles at his presence. The mountains quake. His voice, the psalmist says, breaks the cedars. Yea, the cedars of Lebanon. At his voice, the deer give birth. Flowers come into bloom. Everything is at his command. I have absolutely nothing to fear. So I pray that the Lord will help us to begin living our lives like that. Verse 2, For the transgression of a land, many are the princes thereof, but by a man of understanding and knowledge, the state thereof shall be prolonged. When there's transgression in the land, regimes change constantly. Revolution is the norm. People get voted in, voted out. Different dynasties, dynasties take place because with transgression and sin, everything is chaotic and messed up. What's wrong with this country? Christians say. Can you not see? It's transgression. It's sin. That's the problem. I mentioned Sunday. The Lord blessed me this week. I don't know which day it was. <clears throat> Hadn't been many, I guess. We're only at Wednesday. But um, I was thinking about the proclamation that our current president made about uh, Easter and being transgender visible. I don't know what it, what it was called. And, and a lot of people being just all upset about it. I mean, it, it was all over the news everywhere. <clears throat> and I, I was on my quiet time. No, it was. Yeah, it was my quiet time, but I wasn't walking yet. I was, I was just sitting in the living room. And the Holy Spirit reminded me of a verse in Psalm 2. And I just meditated through the whole psalm as, as I was sitting there going, wow, Christians are all up in the air. How dare the president disgrace and dishonor the most holy of all Christian days, Easter, ooh, boo, hoo, hoo, hoo. David in Psalm 2 says, Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The, the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast their cords from us. And then the next verse says this. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh and have them in derision. The Lord's not going, I can't believe what they did to my Easter. He laughs. The idea that, are you kidding me? Really? You, a mere mortal? You think you're going to mock me? Hurt me? Stop me? Slip? Yet, he says. Have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion? I will declare the decree. The Lord, right? Oh, man, oh, man, oh, man. That's not the chapter we're in, Gordon. 
but a man of understanding and knowledge, the state thereof shall be prolonged. We're waiting and anticipating that man. His name is Jesus. And when he comes, he's going to set everything right. Excited. A poor man that oppresseth the poor is like a sweeping rain which leaveth no food. A torrential downpour that leaves nothing in its wake. They that forsake the law praise the wicked, but such as keep the law contend with them. They that break the law, they praise the wicked. What are we supposed to do? Contend with them. We're to stand for what is right, what is true. We're not to cower down because we're as bold as a lion. Evil men understand not judgment, but they that seek the Lord understand all things. Wow, what a verse. What a verse. Chronicles talks about the men of Issachar. I mentioned this just recently. They had understanding. They were men of understanding. They knew what to do in their time. That's the way we ought to be. Men and women of understanding. The Lord says right here, they understand all things. Better is the poor that walketh in his uprightness than he that is perverse in his ways, though he be rich. We've seen multiple verses like this that basically tell us that our character and what we have on the inside is far more important than any and everything that we have on the outside. Whoso keepeth the law, verse 7, is a wise son, but he that is a companion of riotous men shameth his father. He that by usury and unjust gain increaseth his substance, he shall gather it for him that will pity the poor. God's going to make sure it gets to where it's supposed to go. And it's going to end up in the hands that he wants it to be in. He that turneth away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be an abomination. Ooh. Gordon paraphrase. If you don't listen to me, why do you think I should listen to you? It is amazing, is it not? The people who are living in willful, conscious, deliberate sin talk about praying and asking God to answer their prayers. God says, you don't listen to me? Why do you think I should be listening to you? We studied in Proverbs already. Wisdom cries out, cries out, cries out, cries out for the simple, cries out. And then wisdom says this, because you refused, I'm going to laugh when your calamity comes. Wisdom says there's going to come a day when you're going to finally want me and I'm going to step back and watch you. Figure it out in your own foolishness. Hmm. We'll just, as another one, we'll just leave, we'll just leave right there. Whoso call, causeth the righteous to go astray in an evil way, he shall fall himself into his own pit. But the upright shall have good things in possession. This reminds me of a man in the Old Testament named Balaam. Balaam was hired to curse God's people. And he couldn't curse them. All he could do was bless them. God wouldn't let him curse them. But in, in one of the things that he says, he says, let me die the death of the righteous. But the book of Numbers tells us that he did not. He died with the Midianites. Because if you lead the righteous astray, 
you're going to fall into the pit. That's why it's so important for us to consider more of what we do beyond just ourselves. So many Christians are like, well, I've got freedom in Christ. I can do what I want. Get over it. You do have liberty in Christ, but you should measure that with a threefold test. Paul says, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought into uh, the, the bondage of any. And then in another verse, chapter 10 of Corinthians, he says, all things edify not. So number one, utility. Is this thing that I'm doing beneficial to me? All things are lawful for me, but not all things are expedient. In other words, all, everything that I could possibly do that I'm free to do is not necessarily beneficial for me. And he says, I will not be brought into the power of any. Number two, authority. The second test is authority. If I do this, if I take my liberty and freedom in Christ and do this, could this possibly have authority over my life? I.e. addiction, bondage, whatever. And then lastly, he says, everything doesn't edify. So charity, utility, authority, charity. Yes, I'm free to do this, but what is this going to do to my brother if he sees me do it? That's why I don't believe, do whatever you want. I don't believe people in the ministry should drink. Because if the pastor's standing up here talking about drinking, and he is free in Christ to do so, so long as he doesn't get drunk. But if there's someone sitting out here who's recently saved, and God's trying to bring them out of alcoholism, and he's up here talking about his drinking, that individual is going to go, well, if the pastor can do it, then it must be okay for me to do it. And he stumbles his brother. I'll never forget, I was a youth pastor in Gulf Breeze, and I had a little Honda Civic, had a little sunroof that could slide back, and I'd, I'd get off work there at the church, and I love me some IBC root beer. And if you know what an IBC root beer is, you know that that bottle looks just like a beer bottle. It's got this little cap on it, just the same. And I'd pop that thing, and I'd roll the windows back, and that cool breeze out there, and I would just ride back into the sunset, back to Pensacola, and I had me an IBC root beer. Cool, man. It was nice. And one day, going through Naval Ivo, Naval Ivokes, the Holy Spirit convicted my heart. So what would you do if one of those young people driving through Gulf Breeze saw you turning that back and drinking it down, riding down 98? And I thought, ooh, I never thought about that, Lord. You're pretty smart. I still drink IBC root beer, but not in the car driving down the road. Because I don't want people to see me and think something that is really not. The Bible says, let not your good be evilly spoken of. There's a lot of other applications that, that I'm sure you guys can, can apply to your own life. Verse 11, the rich man is wise in his own conceit, but the poor that hath understanding searcheth him out. It's interesting that the elite in our nation think we're dumb, but we can see right through their foolishness. When righteous men do rejoice, there is great glory. But when the wicked rise, a man is hidden. Run and hide. We've already looked at the verse, a prudent man sees the evil and he hides himself, right? Twice we've seen that in the scripture. Verse 13, wow, here's, here's one we could spend the rest of our, our time on. He that covereth his sin shall not prosper. But whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. 
It is human nature in our fallen state to cover up, to conceal our sin. That's why we make excuses. That's, that's why we justify. That's why we, we, we spin things. That's, that's why we, you know, we, we, we project it on other people. It's been happening from the very beginning. Adam and Eve, they realized they were naked. They covered themselves up. God shows up in the garden. And not only are they concealing it, they're, they're, they're trying to, to do the switcheroo. It's, it's, it's the woman you gave me. It's the serpent's fault. The devil made me do it. Just the other day, I was just sharing with someone earlier, just the other day, the Lord had me to just go down memory lane, and I'm still compiling the list. But, but there, are, there are verses. I don't know what number I'll end up getting to, but I, I can just think back over the last decade of my life, even beyond, but, but more so recently especially, versus transformable truths in my life. And, and not just truths that, okay, I read in the Bible and I highlighted them or underlined them, but, but, but verses that, that I owned, verses that the Holy Spirit convicted my heart, gave me revelation, gave me the faith to believe it, to apply it to my life, to make it who I am. And they've changed me. I, I'll never be the same as a result. And one of those verses is Psalm 51.6. And that verse says, Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward part, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. What David is saying is, when I get real with you, when I'm truly honest, when I lay myself bare before you, then, and only then, will you truly be able to replace that sin in my life with wisdom, with, with understanding, with the ability to move past it and live without it. If I cover it up, if I, if I conceal it, if I try to hide it, if I live in hypocrisy, if I deny it, that's not me. No, that's, if, if I do all of those things, I'm going to continue in that sin. It's a fact. And, and, and I'm sure every one of us in this room can think of sins that, that we've done that with, Maybe in the past, and it, and it just took forever to get victory over it. Or, you, or, or maybe you know someone that you're like, wow, this person just seems to just stay stuck in this thing. They're in denial. They won't admit it. They're just... But he says, if you'll confess it. There's something very powerful that I've found in my life, coming into God's presence. And confession, by the way, is simply agreement. That's what confession is. It's agreement. Confession is me coming into God's presence and acknowledging what is in my life is what he says it is. Not, you know, Lord, I mean, sometimes I have a tendency to kind of bend the truth, you know, a little white lie. I mean, no. Confess, that is not confession. Confession is, Lord, you're a God of truth. You are the truth. There is no lie in you. It is impossible for you to lie. And the one you contrast with yourself is Satan, who is the father of lies, who everything out of his mouth is a lie. That is his native language. I should be speaking your word. But I'm speaking the words of your enemy. And you tell me in Proverbs 6 that you hate a lying tongue. Father, I have a lying tongue. As Isaiah says in chapter 6, I am a man of unclean lips. You are not pleased with what I say. That is confession. That's confession. And the moment I do that, I open myself up for the work in the ministry of the Holy Spirit. I open myself up for the blood of Christ that John talks about in 1 John, was it 1-9? 1-7, 1-9? If you'll confess, if you'll confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. But it's not just cleansing. 
Notice, he says, if you'll confess it and forsake it, there's a conquering that takes place. Not with, Lord, forgive me for what I did yesterday and for what I did today. And you know tomorrow I'm going to do it again. Forgive me. For that. That's not confession. That's playing games with God. As a matter of fact, those areas of my life where I have, I have grown exponentially, I have become militant with things in my life. Where I've had to say, no more. This is it. This is where the line is drawn. Here I am, Lord. Do what you have to do. Rid me. Root this up out of my life. But if I'll confess, there's a conquering that comes. There's a conquering that comes. He's able to change our lives. But if we, we cover up, it'll never happen. It'll never happen. And if you're here this, this night and you're, you struggle with this because you're like, ah, Can I just tell you that if there was ever a place, if there was ever a place and ever one that you could be completely honest with, it is God. It is your Lord. Because newsflash, he already knows. <laughs> the only one that you're fooling is yourself and maybe a handful of other people. He already knows you. Verse 14, happy is the man that feareth always. That is not, that is not fear, uh, dread fear. That's reverence. That's, that's the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Happy is that man who is always living his life in a reverential awe of who God is. If somebody would have told me five years ago that one of the most transforming things in my life would be simply knowing who God is, I would have thought, ah, come on. But it's so true, right? Beholding is becoming. I was talking to someone, we were talking about humility and, and pride and, 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 and all of that. We, we don't become humble by trying to be humble. You'll never be humble. I'm trying to be humble, Lord. I'm trying to be humble, Lord. No, you will become humble when you see God for who he is. That is a direct result of seeing God for who he is. You can't help but to be humble. Happy is the man or woman that lives their life in godly fear. It's a happy state of living. There's nobody in this room that doesn't want to be happy. We all want to be happy. And we just got told a tidbit of how we could do that by simply saying, you are God, and every day of my life, I want to live in that knowledge and truth. You're God, and you're with me. And you're awesome, and you're glorious, and you are wonderful, and you're merciful, and you're long-suffering, and you're all-powerful, and you're all-knowing, and you're good. And I'm getting happy just already. This morning, holding my little grandson, we were talking about how God, how good God is. Well, I was talking. But that was the conversation we, we were having. And here's how it all started. I'm sitting there and I'm holding him this morning. And the Holy Spirit reminded me of a verse that says, underneath are the everlasting arms. And I almost puddled up when I realized that my Heavenly Father is holding me like I am holding him. 
I would encourage you, if you get an opportunity, take a newborn into your quiet time. It, it, it's, it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful experience. Happy is the man that feareth always, but he that hardeneth his heart shall fall into mischief. As a roaring lion and a, ra a ranging bear, so is a wicked ruler over the poor people. Roaring lion, charging bear. Why is it that men think this is what leadership looks like? I'm in charge. Hear me roar. That's not leadership. Whether you're a king, president, husband, father, that's not leadership. And if you're having to roar and charge, something's wrong. If you're having to convince the people around you that you should be respected, <laughs> the problem is not the people not respecting you. Most of the time. The problem's you. The problem's me. Amen? The prince that wanteth understanding is also a great oppressor. But he that hateth covetousness shall prolong his days. The prince that lacks understanding. Here's what's in, we'll just we'll, we'll wrap it up right here at this verse. Um, we, we've mentioned this before, but but Solomon had all of these wives and there's only one recorded offspring in the scripture, that's Rehoboam. And when Rehoboam took the throne after his father passed, he, he was trying to get some counsel and some advice on how he was supposed to rule his kingdom. And so he asked the old men, men who had been with Solomon and, and, and kind of been leading with him, and, and, and they said, listen, what you really should do is give the people a tax break. He said, you should, you should speak peaceably to them. You, you should cut their taxes, make life a little bit easier on them. And he says, you should serve them. And if you'll do that, these people will follow you forever, these older gentlemen said. He says, oh, okay. And then he went and asked the young men that grew up with him. Look, young people... I'm not suggesting that you can't learn anything from your peers. But if you really want life, wisdom, maybe ask somebody that knows more than you and the person standing next to you knows, right? I mean, they have the same life experience that you have. They, they probably don't know any, any more than you know about any given situation, mostly. I would advise you go ask somebody who's been there, done that, got the T-shirt, and, and, and is succeeding. But this is not what Rehoboam do, does. Rehoboam asks the young guys, and the young guy says, here's what you ought to do. You need to go out there, and when you give the State of the Union, you need to tell them, my daddy was nothing. I'm going to be 10 times worse than him. I'm going to oppress you and make life difficult for you, and you have seen nothing yet. And he lost most of the kingdom that day. <laughs> because you can't rule by oppression. One of the things that amazes me about God, we're wrapping it up right here, is he doesn't rule by oppression. Do you know that God has never made me do anything? Think about that. The all-powerful one has never made me do a single thing. That's power. If you want to know what power looks like, that's power. And consequently, that power is also love. And love never manipulates. Love never demands. 
Love just loves. That's what love does. Yeah, but what if they... Love just loves. 